Sorry, this is the presentation. One minute. Yeah. So, so I welcome all uh, for this webinar on augmented reality by Jurian and Edward. So before we start off with this uh, webinar, I request all the participants to please use the chat and Q&A sections for any queries or anything which you would like to know. So please let us know through these sections and please address it to the panelist. So before we proceed with the webinar, here's the quick intro about uh, Jurian and Edward. So Jurian joined us. Um, Sagitti Mobile and started working on the Philip U project where he has been part of the app team for more than two years now. First as a developer and quickly growing into the role of lead development, combining it with the role of Scrum Master. He studied what translates uh, to computer science with a major in software development. In his spare time, he likes to meditate, listen to podcasts, read books, play video games, and do kickboxing. Julian also likes listening to music and traveling. With respect to Edward, Edward is a mobile developer for both iOS and Android, and is very passionate about new technologies, and that's the reason he took up the challenge with Julian to set up the first AR workshop at Sujiti. Currently working as a lead developer in Philips via Sujiti, the most exciting part of his role is that he gets to guide the client about the most suitable technical solutions to the challenges. In case you have any questions about the mobile domain and related subjects, please feel free to approach Edward. So over to you, Julian and Edward, to let take us through this webinar. Thank you, Dupika. What a great introduction. It's always nice to have such a such a, an introduction. It's always a lot of fun for us as well. We'd like to welcome everyone. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can just write them in chat. So either Deepika, you can interrupt us during if people have questions, then we'll take a moment to answer them. Otherwise, at the end, we'll get back to all the questions that we missed throughout the presentation. So we will make sure that your questions get answered. And sure. Can you kick yeah. us off? So I'm not going to um, mention our names again. It's Edward and Julian. You all know us. So welcome to this uh, augmented reality uh, webinar. Now, uh, what's on the menu today? So it's very important before we begin to know where we are going. So we are going to discuss uh, VR, AR, MR. I'll use those uh, abbreviations so for virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed, uh, mixed reality. So that at the end of this um, webinar, you know the differences, you know the available uh, platforms, and you also know more about uh, the technology, the, term, uh, the terminology used, and uh, how to go about it. And we'll also share some code so that in your free time or active time, you can uh, build some uh, amazing uh, platforms, uh, sorry, applications. <clears throat> now, uh, before we start, and I think, uh, Deepika can update us who has answered the questions. How many of us have ever used uh, a virtual reality device or mixed reality device or AR device? So in this case, I have used a virtual reality device a couple of times. Okay. Like for video games, mm -hmm. when I went to a friend, they had their setup. Yep. And actually, we could just try it give it a shot. Well, AR, of course, there are some big, great applications, mm -hmm. which we'll also go through today, show you a couple of demos. Yep. So I think we can move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julian. <clears throat> now, uh, let's go to the uh, differences so that it's very clear because sometimes when we are uh, talking about these uh, three uh, channels, I call them channels or media, of uh, displaying information, people mix up the words. Now, uh, let's start uh, with uh, VR. Maybe my colleague here can give us uh, what he thinks about VR. Of course. Yes. VR is a application of the technology where you are completely immersed into a virtual world. You sure. don't see anything 
as from the real world. Mm -hmm. We just see uh, oftentimes cartoonish stuff or just a rebuilt re version of the world to represent your virtual world. Good point. So as Julian said, I'll just pick up only the keywords because this definition has been good. So it's virtual. Everything is created. So which means you need a special uh, device to view it. In this case, you can see in this image that the user has a headset on top of his uh, face. face. And he has some plugins in his ear, so which means he can explore this world. Now, let's not confuse this with just a movie being displayed. This headset has the ability to detect the user's environment, uh, sorry, the user's uh, movement, the user's inclination. So if you tilt to the left, tilt to the right, spin around the, uh, spin around this, uh, the place, you are really immersed into that world. You can move around and to look further, when uh, this is expanded into more real world applications, you can even touch that virtual world and then your touch events can uh, stimulate uh, some actions in that uh, virtual world. So an example of Microsoft for now is whereby if you're working with a Microsoft tool, you're really immersed into that without any obstructions from the, from the external world. For people like me who are some kind of HDHD, we find this very useful so that you can really focus on work because if someone passes by, my attention is already gone. Now, it's not just work, there's always fun. The game industry is really... Uh, Edward, uh, yes? are you sharing your screen? Yes. We are not able to see it. Oh. Oh my God, could you quickly see? Hmm? Ooh, that's a big mistake. Hmm. Uh, share, click share, share. Uh, this one. Share. Oh, so does it work now? Yeah, we are able to see it now. <laughs> so we'll just uh, go through quickly in the uh, virtual world. So I was at the Microsoft example. This one I've already gone through it. I think everybody can see it now. Yeah, we are able to see it now. Exactly. Oh, very good. So with the Microsoft example, just a summary when you're working, you can uh, be immersed into that um, into that application, have no distractions from uh, distractions from a, a, the external world, which is very good for creative people. And for the gaming industry, it's not just play, uh, pressing buttons on a console. This is something whereby you're physically moving. I remember the days of the Nintendo Wii which was a very popular uh, video console, game console, because we could move, we could play fight games, and if your whole body is, you know, is moving, then it's more fun. And in this example, we can see someone playing a video game, yet they are seeing the, the characters against which uh, they are playing, which is, which is really cool. So you notice what we, uh, Julian said, uh, you are really immersed, you have some uh, tools, gadgets to use to put input, you know, to stimulate that virtual world, and then you have a gadget to experience that back. However, big players they don't, uh, in the mobile world, they don't rest in the technology world. One of them is uh, Google. A few months ago, that's actually last year, around November, Google patented um, had a patent, they patented a product which was uh, called PR Shoes. You can uh, look it up later. Which means that you don't have to buy expensive gadgets. You can put on, on these roller skate uh, shoes with the rollers. I don't know how they're going to do it, but they are smart people. And you put on some headset from Google, and then you can experience the virtual world. Now, the power of Google, think about Street View. Up to now, you had to click on a computer move the mouse around, try to turn around your laptop. Now, if Google brings this on the market, it will be fun because for Julian, you could right now go to see your client Robo Bank. You could come visit my home in Africa and see what happened there. Or we can even visit India, walk through the streets of India with uh, the streets of Delhi, India, the country. So walk through some streets around the world, go into jungles just in your own living room and we know it's going to be cheap. So 
it's very interesting to see that uh, you know big uh, big players are really investing a lot into this field. So it really has big future uh, future potential. Now uh, mixed reality. I would like people in the chat to type while Julian is giving us a good explanation of what mixed reality is. So you give your you type in the chat what you think of mixed reality, and uh, let's see if your definition comes up the same as uh, Julian's definition. Yes, mixed reality, and I'll, I'll wait a couple of seconds okay. before I start the explanation, so yes. we'll get some, uh, some results without me influencing them too much. Very good. So type in what you think mixed reality is. And then in the meantime, I'll just start. Yes. So mixed reality is, well, it's, in, it's kind of in the name. It's actually a mix between the virtual stuff taken from virtual reality yes. and it's put onto the real world to enhance it. This will also mean that you need some different hardware. For mm -hmm. example, the goggles that you would be wearing will not be closed off. Rather, there will be some see-through slate of glass, for example, in which you can still see the world. I can still see my actual physical desk. However, the mixed reality technology will put something on my desk, which I can interact with without actual like game controllers <coughs> or handles or other hardware that is, for example, attached to my hands. So I can just see virtual stuff in the physical world I can interact with them as if they were physical however they are completely virtual okay very good uh, description and now you can match your this uh, what you typed into the chat with what Julian said and see how close you come so what Julian says is that you have your real world and on that real world a virtual world is drawn on top of that real world now what is fun is that you don't need the gadgets uh, to touch it. You can touch any object in that mixed world, and then you get feedback. You will see actions happening. So the objects themselves, they, this, that kind of intelligence, which is uh, projected onto those models, which are being drawn everywhere, which are being hankered on, on that uh, mixed world. Now, it's kind of uh, sketchy, like abstract-oriented, However, they are real-time applications. Now imagine, imagine a, uh, architects who are trying to build a house. Now they could use the old way of using solid and uh, some other technologies to kind of uh, do the frame of the house, or, or they could use uh, a mixed uh, reality application whereby they have that lens on top of them. They, there's a projection which is a, share, which is a shared experience for all three of them. You can see there are three people involved here. And they can touch anywhere on that model, and, that mo and, and, that, and that's the, rea the result of that touch will be played in the, in the reality of everybody who has that headset. So if you think about it, if you are to buy a house and you're modeling it with an architect right now, you don't have to think too much. Where will the bathroom be? Where will this be? Where will this, that be? You can, together with the architect, experience the whole building of your house, how will it be and how things will fit. So this is also another domain of this immersive technology. Yes, the community is coming up. So we've seen uh, virtual reality. We've seen mixed reality, which is actually the hardest of all, because you're going to, if, if that object moves, it moves in the world of all those people. And if someone else touches that object, it's also going to react. Maybe you put intelligence that it crumbles. The small white people you see there, they, you can move them around. So it's complex, it's immersive, it's massive to a degree, and it's very useful for real world application. So for people in engineering, this is the way to go. People in, in training, in flight training, and uh, lots of simulation. For just a side note, Microsoft is uh, making lots of big deals with, their, with big companies, with big institutions for the application of their HoloLens in their you know, product, uh, product cycle uh, to their customers. So it's pretty interesting. 
Now to move to why we came here today is augmented reality. Now, same procedure, type into the chat box what you think augmented reality is, considering we've covered mixed reality and virtual reality. Well, Julian gives us uh, some good definition. Yes, I think people in general, they will already be quite, quite interested in augmented reality, at yeah. least I would hope so. Mm. So I, I hope there's good definitions in chat later. Yeah. But I think <clears throat> that I can just start with this one right now. So okay. augmented reality is a technology where you need a specific separate device on, for example, your phone or some specialized tools like screens, uh -huh. video streams on a, a plane, for example, when flying, and you use that separate tool to put something into the reality, but it's not completely immersive. Yeah. You would not behave like you normally would. You really use this tool, you use your phone to look into a street, to mm -hmm. put something on there, to look at, you look your, put your phone and you take a look at a product, and then, for example, health information shows up. Mm -hmm. But you really need this separate device. So through this device, you will interact with that virtual world. Yep. So there are no uh, specific like controllers that are, are attached to your hands. Mm -hmm. It's just simply a device like your phone, to which you would interact with to get actual interaction with that virtual world. Very good. Thank you. So. Julian has mentioned that uh, it's just a projection to the, um, to the existing world. It's just you have your world, you augment by adding something on top of it. And he has mentioned uh, the fact that, yeah, oh, this is, <laughs> I was looking at something else. Very good. So one example is, uh, I think most of you, have, some of us have played this game. It was 2016 or? I think so, yes. 2016 when it was popular, Pokemon Go. So the funny thing is, it's, you can't touch it outside your phone, so you have to tap on your phone. That's the limitation, or oh, that's the fun, because mo mobile phones are everywhere, and it's very easy to, to make any special devices, mobile phones everywhere. Now, it could be a game, you could consider this one as just a game, but when I'm building applications, I always look also on the social side of the applications which I'm building. And uh, last time I came, I read about this story of uh, a, an old man in Taiwan, because there's this kind of situation where old people tend to be lonely. But this old gentleman in Taiwan, he had 11 mobile phones, and he would ride around Taipei catching Pokemon, uh, Pokemon those uh, thingies. And he became very popular in his neighborhood. He could move, he could walk, which is good for his physical fitness, but he was also part of the community. Because when people used to catch these Pokemon, they used to go to parks and they used to go to fields. It was a great experience for everybody. So, I mean, I don't know about everybody, but one thing I know is if you're building an application and you're really thinking about the social side, I feel personally that it's really worth it. It's really worth the time you invest in. So we are not just building games. It's not just for games, but we are building society. We are building humanity with this kind of technology. We are promoting shared experiences. Now, let's not talk about just the, uh, you know, social free for everything, for everybody. Let's go about commercial. Now, in the commercial world, augmented reality is being used uh, by so many people. There's New York Times, there's BMB, they are all using augmented reality in their apps. One of uh, the most used one, for example, in the Netherlands, the most uh, available for use is the IKEA app. Now, for those who know IKEA, it's uh, a place where you can buy items. How do I call them in English? Furniture. Furniture. You can buy furniture for your house. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> now, the funny thing is, previously, you had to think about your room. You go to the store, and then you buy furniture, which you think is good for your room. Now, I am not good with my memory that much, so I could take a photo of the room. But the photo, the problem with the photo is the lighting, you know? You don't know the lighting, you don't know the perfect corner, you can't measure them, so you reach in the store, you buy something, you return it. Now, IKEA solves that. You can 
point your camera to where you want your stool or your furniture to be. And then this platform, because it helps with light estimation and then physical wall detection and movement detection, you can place your furniture in that exact location. The light is calculated exactly how it would look like in that location. And then you can move around to see if it fits perfectly. Now, that is a good example. And many other companies are starting to implement it. For example, Cool Blue, where you can buy electronic appliances. Now, in the near future, you'll be able to place your televisions in the room to see if it fits, if it matches with the whole uh, you know, room and setting. Now, you have something to add to it? Yes, I think it's very important that now we've talked about these three specific applications of immersive technology. Yeah. So you have the virtual reality, you have mixed reality, and you have augmented reality, each with their own traits, their own pros, and their own cons. It's important <coughs> to realize that if a client comes with a question, that you understand, ah, okay, this means I am going to need an augmented reality app. This means I am going to need a virtual reality <coughs> setup. Ah, yep. this means that in this case, I would like a mixed reality headset to actually send out with engineers that go into the field, for example. Yep. It's very important to make that distinction <coughs> to also realize what technology you are going to need for the solution. And that leads us to the next part of this presentation, which is going to be a couple of the available augmented reality solutions. And so right now we'll dive into some of the different frameworks, platforms, if you will, that you could use to dive into augmented reality solutions. Very good. So. You know, you have an idea, your client, you've agreed with a client, now where are you going to build it? <laughs> Very important. Uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, Wikitude. I don't know about you, but I didn't know much about it. They are not so much in the news. However, they have been around for a long time. Since 2008, founded in South Park. What they did is to give uh, an augmented reality experience based on the user's location. So it was geolocation based. Now, way before Pokemon started doing that, these guys were having something similar. And it was available for all mobile phones. I'm saying it was, and it's still available. Now, with uh, Wikitude, using their SDK, which is compatible with most of the development languages available, Swift, Objective-C, Java, you can build these applications and make them available on several uh, several platforms. So iOS, Android, feature phones, desktop, browser, everything. You can visit them. However, they are not open source. Let me put that in a disclaimer. So it's a, it's a proprietary technology. And uh, so there's a part where you, you have to code. However, there's also a part where you don't have to code. If you don't want to code, you can use their studio. Sign up for their studio. It's all drag and drop. Supports many platforms. Now, the second one is um, Google's ARCO. Now, I love Google because of its open source nature. Sorry, <laughs> Julia. <laughs> so, um, because it's open source, you can uh, look into their code base. It's all available. So, ARCO is just an extension of a previous project which they had, which was called Filament. It has some very good uh, you know, documentation. So, Basically, if they do the heavy lifting for you, they put it in an appliance in, on a platform which you can build on top of. Now, just to provide an extra note on that, without going too much in details, uh, for the examples which you will see on GitHub about Google's AR Core or Augmented Reality for Android, it will be focusing on the scene form. Now, scene form is just a layer on top of uh, AR Core to make building application way easy so that you don't have to go through the OpenGL 3D rendering. So it's something on top. Now, the reason why I say AR code, because if you want to build for Android using Unity or other platform, you will need to use this AR code for, no, you don't have to, but you could use this AR code for Google so that you have more uh, native APIs. 
So that's the disclaimer. If you're building for Android, uh, you can use the hardcore AR core, which is a bit, a lot of work, a steep learning curve, which is doable. Or you can go for Synform, which is a simplified uh, version. Lastly, to mention about Google is if you're building for Google, never forget that you have more than a billion users. So it's a good, a great potential for Android developers. Now the next one, which I'm not going to go into details, is Apple. It's one of the big players. As I told you, these days they are very active, releasing new SDKs all the time. You can uh, achieve a lot more than you could achieve like six months back because every couple of months there's something new coming up. Julian will go more about Apple, so I'll not go uh, into, into that. I'll move to Vuforia. Now, Vuforia is also one of those uh, hybrid uh, platforms, not hybrid in a sense of, uh, of um, JavaScript HTML, but you build using their platform, and then it's available for, for, the, native, uh, for the native operating systems. Now, the advantage of Vuforia it's easy to use, as those who have used it are saying. And you can build an application in exactly five minutes, they say it, on YouTube. So if you Google build an application in five minutes, Vuforia, you should see one of those videos popping up. And it supports even older Android version all the way to 2.9, so which is a, something slightly better than uh, Google, which supports um, only recent telephones from a recent uh, OS from around Android uh, 9. 8 is supported, but not extensively, but mainly 9. So another player to go to is uh, Unity. So last but not least, for those who have developed uh, games, Unity is just, you build it in um, C Sharp or JavaScript, and then they compile natively to for iOS and for Android. So you get your uh, Java bytes or Android uh, Objective C code generated for you. Now, Unity has the ability, uh, if you want to use, uh, if you want to build AR apps for Apple, you have to use AR kit. You have to put the plugin there, it's, it's possible. Uh, you can also put the plugin for Vuforia. You can also put in a plugin for AR code. So for those who know JavaScript and know C Sharp, this is an exciting uh, platform to just stick to that and uh, build for iOS and Android. However, the only difference is you have a lot of overhead. So the best thing we could recommend for right now, if you have the opportunity to, is to go for Google's AR Core or Synform or Apple's AR Key. Now, now that I've covered uh, the platforms, I'll uh, hand it over to Julian to go into more technical details to give you a view of yeah, what terminology is there and what else. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've given an extensive look into a couple of technologies that you can use to build AR applications. But you've chosen your technology now. You know what the client wants. You've chosen your technology and now you actually need to start with building something AR. And we'll use this table here as an example of the specific things that you will run into when working with AR. Let's start out with a plane. A plane is the virtual representation of a surface or a wall that you would see in real life. If I would put something on this table and there is no virtual world to represent that table, it would fall through the table. In real life, this would not make sense. In the virtual world, it completely makes sense because in the virtual world, there is no table. If we put a plane on top of this table represented by this green box, the virtual world knows, ah, there is a table here, and I know that all the objects in my virtual world need to interact with that table. Then, an anchor. And then, maybe difficult to see in the presentation, but there is a little golf course 
flag on there. Very good. And this represents an anchor. An anchor is the point in the world that you can use for reference. So you cannot see it right now because I have taken away the green plane, but this table represents our plane. And then this anchor is in the middle of it. They represent the center point for the table and we can place all objects in this world relative to that plane with, of course, the coordinates that the anchor represents. But yeah, just having an anchor is not really visual. <coughs> what this flag is, I've actually put something on it to make that anchor visual, which is a node. So in the previous picture, the node was a golf flag. In this picture, the node is a pool ball. So there is a pool game. I have the table represented by the plane. I have a couple of anchors to represent the position of different pool balls. And then I have the nodes. And the nodes are the objects in the virtual world that are going to be useful to the user. So if my user uses this app, they can see ah, I have a couple of nodes, which are pool balls, and they will probably interact with each other. If a pool ball goes into another pool ball, I would expect the other pool balls to move. And this movement is done with a physics body. Again, I've used this table to represent a plane. Can you imagine that the, there's some kind of world map on this table? It's probably some pins would drop onto that. So if I would tap a position on the world map on, the, on my plane, I summon a pin which will drop from the sky. And because of the physics body, we can set it to, for example, a dynamic physics body. The technology tool uh, stacks that we just mentioned they will calculate the physics for you. That means that if you just put something in the air, it will drop down, and it, as long as it interacts with the planes on the table, they will stop there, because it knows how to calculate these positions. Speaking of these positions, these are all saved in Vector3 format, and Vector3 simply represents the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis for all the elements in our world. For most technologies, this will be based on the center anchor of the plane. So, what does this look like in practice? We've chosen our technology. In this case, for this example, I am going to use the Apple AR kit framework for all my examples. We know the terminology now, so let's dive into it. And with these couple of lines of code, we can see that we can already detect horizontal planes. So the thing that we saw on the table, the green area, it's actually quite simple because these frameworks, they handle all the heavy lifting for us. What we tell the code is, ah, I want to do some world tracking, I want to do some plane detection, and I want it to be a horizontal planes, like a table. And if you say run, then it will all work for you. You don't have to program anything yourself. And that's actually pretty great. Which means that if we implement something like a note for anchor method, that if our app automatically detects one of the anchors in the world, and we've told it to do some horizontal plane detection, so if our app detects a table, we can simply put one of these gold flags there. And we've already done something with AR. I think this is the, the, the strength of <coughs> these tools. They simply give you some frameworks. You have a couple of lines of code. You tell it, I want to do some horizontal detection. 
And if you detect something, I want to put a flag there. And it already works. I have a question. Of course. The, the flag is just, is it like an emoji or is it something you downloaded from the internet? The flag is a simple emoji wow. to represent an object in the world. I could also just put my name there, for example. And the SK label node, mm -hmm. as you can see in the second block of the code, it will, it will know how to represent itself as text. It will know how to represent itself as an emoji. And since this is all framework by Apple, you don't have to be able to walk around it because it will always be facing the user since it's 2D. And this flag, this will always show up nicely, even if you put it on a table and walk around it. Okay. In the end, only with a couple of lines of code, you're able to put something in the virtual world on top of your physical world. But there are some limitations and I hope that this video uh, comes through correctly in the web presentation because with great power that the tools bring you also comes great responsibility to use them correctly. If we look at this video, we can see that if we do the detection a little bit incorrectly, that these pins will start interacting in ways that you as a user would not expect. And this is because all these pins, they will have collision with each other with the white boxes that represent their drop into the world and then even fall off my table. So let's play, see if we can play this video again just to make sure that it uh, comes true on the stream correctly. So again, I put pins in this world on the virtual world that I've detected on top of this table and the pins have an incorrect interaction with each other. If we then take a couple of lines of code and clean it up, we'll get to an interaction that I think will feel very familiar to a lot of people, since we'll just be dropping some pins on the map. And I think even Google Maps has had this, Apple Maps has had this. Yeah. You simply take a world map, which is of course represented by the table here. You can click on a specific position and pins will start dropping. But even in this application, this only takes a couple of lines of code. Simply detect the plane, put some nodes into the world based on the anchors that it can detect for you put the pins a meter up into the air, they have a dynamic physics body. They will simply drop onto your plane and it will look quite stunning already. But if we go into the 3D world, we need to define some more. And there's some code on the screen. Don't be scared by it. This is the code to represent a pool ball. And we see some numbers there. We see, like, ah, you can define a sphere. We can see in the, a little bit above the center that, yeah, the material needs to be a red color, which will mean that this is going to be a red pool ball. Again, a dynamic physics body. So if pool balls run into each other, they will interact. And off lines of code, we can already build something pretty cool again. So if we go to the video, we can see that we can detect the table. It will update based on how much information it gets. If we detect the floor here, which is, of course, also horizontal. We add some pool balls just by clicking on them. And it already looks like a great application. So let's take that video one more time. We do some world detection. And as soon as we tap the screen, we'll place a pool ball there, which is, again, was only a couple of lines of code. You see how we define a pool ball? It looks, yeah, it looks like some code, but it's not too many lines. But suddenly, you already have something that you can interact with. 
So what does it mean to shooting a bullet? Well, we have some detection work to do, like, oh, if I tap the floor, I want to place a pool ball there, which is the code at the bottom. But if we want to tap on a pool ball and actually give it some speed, then we can, again, use the framework's knowledge about these nodes to do that for us. We don't have to do any of the difficult calculations. We can simply say, and this is on the third line of the code, scene view dot hit test on a specific location. This means that if we tap this location, take the first result of what we've tapped on, so we tapped, we may have tapped on multiple things, but if we take the first thing that we've hit and it is an actual pool ball, then we can simply say, apply some force to it, which is also a function provided to us by the framework. So what we've done here is we've taken the force, and since the force always comes out of the object that you've tapped on towards the user, and for a pool ball, that does not make sense, that it goes to the side you've hit it from. So we want to inverse that force, and to give it some oomph, we've multiplied the force. We just say, ah, this is an impulse, apply the force to the pool ball, and it will start rolling. And this is where the real magic happens, since in this next video, we can see that if you tap the pool ball, it starts rolling, the dynamic physics body provided by the framework will make sure the interactions between the objects are correct. So if we tap a pool ball, it will roll into another pool ball and it will actually have the desired effect without us programming or calculating anything. I'm tapping some pool balls here. They are shooting. But if I tap a pool ball and I shoot it into another pool ball, this already feels like quite the natural response from a pool ball, something you would expect. But we did not program anything for that. We did not code anything. We've simply taken <coughs> what the application gives us, the, the platform by, in this case, Apple, and we simply said, ah, this stuff is dynamic. Handle it for us. And yeah, you'll get this as the result in not too many lines of code. And one of the cool things is that we've used these applications as an example, and at the end of our presentation, we'll provide the code to these examples. So what we've done is we've turned these into assignments that you can use to learn programming for AR. We'll have a link to a Git repository with the Apple um, yeah, AR kit tutorials, and we'll have a link to the Google AR core tutorials. And with those, you can simply check out the repository. There will be branches in there for multiple assignments. And we'll hand those out those assignments later. So you can easily build your own pool game, but also see the code for how we built it ourselves. But now let's start with another very cool application of augmented reality technology. And it's all based around this t-shirt. This t-shirt is a product developed to help children with learning about human anatomy. What they've done is they've put a lot of anchors on this t-shirt. But we've also got one of these. So let's see if we can pull this on the, onto the screen. Okay. You say quick time? No, but you've only shared the presentation that's, now. That's why I'm asking. Yes. Want, uh, yes, please. Quick time? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. So let's see. The laptop is right on top of the cable. And there we go. So are you guys able to see us? Where can we see them? Oh, oh yeah, they are still seeing quick time. 
Let's give it a couple of seconds for the, the feed to come through. Not this one. The Pika, are you able to see us or is it still sharing the presentation? We are able to see you all. Ah, oh, okay. great. Then I'm going to pull this back on the screen. Yes. So, ah, it's already detecting. So, as soon as it detects the T-shirt, you see that Edward here. We can look at his rib cage, at his lungs, at his intestines. And if we <laughs> don't shake it too much, that's dangerous. But we can also go into his skeletal system. So we can really look around into his rib cage. Because inside of this application, and we'll show the t-shirt on the screen again soon. Oh, it's shaking a little bit. The detection is quite good, but it's shaky. We can see that on this T-shirt, it's simply represented uh, by a lot of anchors. There are crosses on the T-shirt, there are circles on the T-shirt, there are squares on the T-shirt. And by calculating this position and the, uh, the, the, the length between the things that are on the shirt, this app is able to overlay yeah, his, his body functions, his organs, and this is used in classrooms to actually teach children about anatomy. Yes, yeah, so if we can go back to the slides. Okay. I'll put this back on the table. So, let's see if it's doing what we thought it does. No. Uh, so I click on that. It has to be. Oh, no, Kessel. I'd like to share uh, Microsoft. Yeah, what you can do is you can add it to. So click PowerPoint. So I share this one. And, and then disable uh, Quick Time again. And then I click on the Quick Time. Yes. Disappears. Okay. Yes. So if we take this shirt as an, another example, yeah. we can see that these squares, these crosses, these circles, they actually represent the anchors. And based on these anchors, this app can see, ah, I need to place the heart there. Because I know that this is the size of the body. This is the center. This is the specific part where the heart would be. And suddenly, we have a cool app for educative purposes to help children with. Cool. This brings us to our final slide, which is a couple of QR codes and links. Oh, what did you do? Yeah, very good. So you can scan it. Yes, you can use these links or you can scan these QR codes. And I think we can also provide these links afterwards that you can just get them in the mail. And by going to these pages, you'll find the codes that we have used for all these, all the examples that we've shown today. Not from the t-shirt, this is a commercial product, we do not own the code to that, but the pool game, the pins dropping on the map, a couple of the AR core things that have passed by will also show them yep. the pros and cons in different technologies. We are going to expand these code repositories with some examples of image recognition and putting uh, actual objects based on places with image, uh, image recognition, we'll do so later. And you can always reach us at the email addresses shown there. We are happy to help or to hear from specific <coughs> examples or clients that you've worked with and that have done something with AR. Okay. This leads, uh, leads us to the Q&A section. This is so far we've had the presentation. Is there any questions about AR, some other cool technology that would you would like to yeah, hear from us about some application of the uh, yeah, of, of the, 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 the the technology? You can write to us now. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, Julian and Edward, for taking us through this. Um, audience, please feel free to let us know any queries through the chat and Q&A sections. Let's uh, 
chat on stream. I would like to see that. Yeah. This was at the, at the start. Yeah. Okay, the screen was not shared yet. It's coming on. Deepika? Yeah. Are you seeing any questions coming by? Because we don't see any. Yeah, uh, I haven't got it either. Well, that means we've uh, we have a, we've had a very clear presentation. Oh yes. Now we just need to keep changing. All right. Um, Okay, then uh, if there are no questions. Okay, we have one uh, query from Thomas who says, uh, is this also used to project an interface on car, windows, or ro for road info, et cetera? Yes, very good. There are some applications of that. What we see, for example, at Renault is that they have road indications or the navigation uh, tool that is enhanced by projecting something in the front window. So there is a little glass panel that comes out of the dashboard and we, uh, we see that they project some information on it. Yeah, they'll probably use some in-house uh, technology for that as well rather than one of the frameworks that we've presented today. But I do think that the same principles apply. However, this will always, of course, be 2D since they have a very specific screen that they can use to yep. project on. Okay. Has that yeah. answered your question? Yeah. Uh, there's one more query from Thomas who, who says, uh, are the IKEA and Coolblue examples already fully in production or just delivered as betas? IKEA is in uh, IKEA is in full production. You can download it from the App Store and then from the Google Play Store. Cool Blue is uh, an announcement which is going to be made next week uh, in the Android uh, Developer Group in Amsterdam. So one of their product owner is going to present what work they have done. So I suspect because I, uh, the uh, the event hasn't happened yet. So I suspect somewhere this year they are going to be able to include it in uh, embed it in their cool blue app. Great. So Claudia and Raghavan has uh, conveyed their uh, messages saying uh, thanks uh, for the presentation. It was very clear and very good insights. Okay. Thank you. We are always happy to help and it's uh, very nice to receive happy responses. Right. Uh, Give it a couple more seconds for questions to come in. We got 120 seconds. <laughs> Very strict on time, this guy. I think one more fun thing to share is that at clients in the Netherlands, for example, the Rabobank, which is the second largest bank in the Netherlands, they've started with experimenting apply, uh, experimenting with AR and how to apply it. So they have this grand vision, which is growing a better world together. And they use AR technology to make it fun to do stuff with financial health. They do uh, cool things to show to children, but also to make it a little bit more interesting for adults to think about their financial health and stuff like this is yeah another representation of how powerful this technology can be right we have one more query from Ragon who says uh, any AR based uh, reusable platform for building demos any what any AR based reusable platform for building demos 
So there's a, a couple of the technologies that we've uh, shown, and I will just pull up, for example, Euphoria for five minutes. Well, we can take on um, Euphoria, but I think a good example mm -hmm. in uh, in my experience is simply using ARKit and then saving your code base somewhere. Yeah. So there are some cool things that we have done for Rabobank with image recognition. For example, you place stuff in the world based on a specific image that we've detected. We are using that code base to do something with a search team magazine, where we have a magazine that is going to be enhanced with AR technology. We can still reuse that code base since we've set it up that way. And this will allow yeah, a lot of platforms that if you structure your code, your code correctly, mm -hmm. they can simply take that and plug stuff in and out. Right, thanks for answering uh, those, uh, Edward and Julian. Uh, and thanks for taking us through this uh, interesting webinar as well. So, and uh, all the all the attendees, please feel free to uh, reach out uh, to Edward and Julian in case of any more queries. And thanks for your time as well. So we thanks for help. joining us. We've enjoyed it. OK, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.